those among whom they have come and are still coming. This is why to enact legislation of the kind before Parliament at this moment is to risk throwing a match onto gunpowder. Powell profoundly opposed the race relations bill, but he was out of step with many of his conservative colleagues. I had an employment agency at around that time, which offered to companies CVs of people who might work for them, professionally and technically qualified people. And we'd get the requests back from well-known British companies, and across the top would be no coloreds. Now, that, that was what was happening. I knew it was happening. There's no point in sort of saying, I don't believe it, or hearsay. I knew it was happening. And it, this is what the Labour legislation was about, about outlawing that sort of discriminatory uh, racial behaviour. Ten days before Powell's speech, on the 10th of April 1968, the Shadow Cabinet had met to discuss the Race Relations Bill. Most argued for the legislation. Powell, though deeply opposed, made no comment. He also failed to mention the controversial speech he was planning. It was because he felt that there was almost, almost no point of agreement between him and the Heath men about anything. This came also at the end of three years of growing frustration on Enoch's part with Ted Heath and growing rancor. Ted Heath simply wouldn't accept Enoch's logical premises on almost anything. And I think he took the view that he could sit there and argue till he was blue in the face. And I think that's why he kept quiet about the race relations bill. I just don't think that he saw any point in saying anything. Powell believed that the liberal establishment of politicians, journalists and church leaders had deliberately ignored the concerns of ordinary people. There could be no grosser misconception of the realities than is entertained by those who vociferously demand legislation, as they call it, against discrimination. Whether they be leader writers of the same kidney and sometimes on the very same newspapers, as those which year after year in the 1930s tried to blind this country to the rising peril which confronted it, or archbishops who live in palaces, faring delicately with the bedclothes pulled right up over their heads. <laughs> that sense of an impending danger being ignored was highlighted in an incendiary letter Powell claimed to have received concerning a constituent from Wolverhampton, an elderly widow. The letter alleged that she had been repeatedly intimidated by black immigrants who had moved into her street. There's always this sense that they want to get the women. They're after your women, invoking a widow to make it even more poignant. And then you're sort of thinking of some sort of frail, elderly, uh, white woman besieged by these hulking, great sort of black people all around her. So it's a very interesting way of making a nation feel that it's besieged. Enoch Powell always chose his words with calculated precision. Now he took the greatest gamble of his political career in using language about the widow that no senior politician has dared publicly use before or since. No recording of this section of the speech exists, but these are the words that Powell quoted. She is becoming afraid to go out. Windows are broken. She finds excreta pushed through her letterbox. When she goes to the shops, she is followed by children. Charming. Wide grinning, piccaninnies. Piccaninny is a really potent term. It immediately conjures up this image of the kind of little black sambo, you know, the, the little child with um, corkscrew hair and big, wide bug eyes, big, you know, over-exaggerated thick lips, big nose and so on, and black, black, black skin. You talk about excrement ex 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 in relation to a body of people. You talk about piccaninnies. You deliberately choose, you know, 
a word which debases them, which makes them abject in relation to your civilization, which, uh, which, which, which extrudes them, expels them from a community together. You are really talking about something which is operating, I think, in your own feelings and uh, sensibilities at a very profound and often unconscious level. Underlying Powell's speech was a deep-seated fear. He believed that immigration was fatally weakening the racial, religious and cultural ties that had bound his country together for centuries. All of us need an identity which unites us with our neighbours, our countrymen, those people who are subject to the same rules and the same laws as us, those people with whom we might one day have to fight side by side to protect our inheritance, those people with whom we will suffer when attacked, those people whose destinies are in some way tied up with our own. But the Labour government had recently announced an historic shift which would threaten Powell's deeply held views of what Britain was. The Home Secretary, Roy Jenkins, a liberal reformer, argued that immigrants should no longer have to integrate. Newcomers could retain their own values. It was the birth of a new way of thinking about Britain, multiculturalism. Roy Jenkins made a classic speech, which I contributed to, in which, among other things, he defined integration not as a flattening process, which would turn everybody out in some kind of mould of a stereotyped Englishman, uh, but would be a combination of equal opportunities ac accompanied by cultural diversity in an atmosphere of tolerance. Diversity was the encouragement of people to live together in harmony despite their differences and rejoice in the differences rather than deplore them. But Powell's wartime experience convinced him that this kind of diversity could only lead to violence. Powell spent four years in India. He was fascinated by the complexity and diversity of this ancient civilization. But he also deplored the violent divisions, above all between Hindu and Muslim, which undermined it. Powell saw how communal hatred tore India apart after independence. Around half a million people died during the creation of Islamic Pakistan. Powell believed Indian-style communalism was now rearing its head in his own Wolverhampton constituency. Back in 1921, the people who ran the transport department here laid down that Drivers and conductors should wear the uniform provided, and nothing but the uniform provided. They hadn't thought then of turbans coming into their town, except perhaps when Alibaba was the Christmas pantomime. In 1968, Sikh bus drivers in Pal's constituency went on strike. They believed rules which banned the wearing of turbans and beards went against their religion. When a protester threatened to set fire to himself, the bus company backed down. Paul believed that religious and racial differences were being entrenched by the threat of violence. Here is their means of showing that the immigrant communities can organize to consolidate their members, to agitate and campaign against their fellow citizens, and to overawe and dominate the rest. 